Uh, so now we are really excited also to introduce another Free California partner, um, friend, and <laughs> author, another author. And um, I'm going to hold up his book. <laughs> and it's so inspiring. Um, Pastor Jim Garlow, are you with us, Jim? Rosemary, you got to get your husband, huh? <laughs> and here he comes in the hot seat. Yay! Look at you too. You're so cute. But I have to tell you, because we have an extra minute, so Rosemary, come back there with Jim for a second, okay? Hi! I was so happy to fly down um, for the day. I flew in on, as you know, for your wedding in the morning down San Diego and then came back the you know that afterwards it was such a blessing what a beautiful blessing um and robert wanger blew the shofar his host shofar team robert wanger sends love and blessings also um shofar so great he's been a part of our pre california team still until he made aliyah to israel and as you know because you introduced me to him too i think but anyway so i just have to share because we do have an extra minute here it's kind of a fun thing and this is all a family thing we're all god family so i had um rosemary had been a speaker at a conference for a number of years right and <laughs> and then i had i invited jim to be a speaker and at a conference and so i sent him the flyers and um, it was so cute because Jim, would you share um, about that when you looked at the flyer and you saw Rosemary and her name and what happened? So I kind of feel responsible in a way for bringing you two together <laughs> forever on earth. And we are very grateful for that. <laughs> You're exactly Marriage right. made heaven. Uh, uh, we actually met through Pray California. <laughs> that was a you were the connecting point I'm very grateful for that i did not know the name rosemary schindler and she did not know the name jim garlow and we met through that i actually declined speaking because at the time you asked me it was i was still in grief for the passing of my late wife and so but by the time the conference came some months later i sort of was beginning to come back to to life a little bit and uh that's the first time I connected with Rosemary through that. So we will always be grateful for that. <laughs> but I do remember you told me way back, what, five years ago? How long was that? How long have you been there? Seven years ago. <gasps> no. Seven years? Seven years? Yes. Oh, wow. Completion. Yay. Um, but I remember you told me, okay, seven years ago, when you looked at the flyer and you saw her name, the Lord whispered in your ear, and he said, you're going to marry that woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was you told a, me that. Yeah, no, 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 you're right. You're right. That, that actually did, that did And happen. then your sister, Judy Wade, she was a big influence in getting you together, too. Matchmaker, matchmaker. <laughs> yeah, I asked her, uh, I said, you know Rosemary Schindler? And she said, she's the California gold. California, yes, California Gold, California Golden. California Gold. Yes, she is a true treasure. Rosemary, you are such a treasure to all of us. We just love you so much. So, um, wow, exciting things for you since you stepped down as senior pastor at Skyline Church in San Diego, and then you pretty much hit the road running, both of you. Oh, my goodness. You know, just being... You and President Trump and people saying you look like him and, you know, the pictures of you two together and you, Rosemary, at the prayer breakfast and, and in the uh, at the White House with him and just all the things that you're doing to stand boldly and to blow the shofar as we do in a spiritual realm and call people to awaken and to vote. And I'm so excited because last week, y'all, I ordered a case of these books, well-versed. I'm so excited to pass them out to some of the pastors in Eldorado County and some intercessor friends. And um, boy, it's so rich. Oh. And I tuned in to your Facebook Live on, was that Monday from 6 to 7.15 or so p.m. Pacific time? And I thought I'd just go on for 
a few minutes. I could not break away from the Facebook Live and watching you. And how often are you on Facebook Live with that, with Well Versed? It's fortnightly, which is a fancy British way of saying once every two weeks. Okay. Every other other Monday night at 6 p.m. And they can go to your uh, friend you on Facebook, or how do they listen? How do we listen in? Well, Facebook, it's, it's actually, if they'll go to the Well-Versed World Facebook, we're live off of that. Now, we have a secondary source, just Jim Garlow Facebook. We have a watch party from there. Uh, but the information about it is at uh, wellversedworld.org, wellversedworld.org. The next one will be, let's see, Monday night, <laughs> August, <laughs> August 24. We'll Everyone, on. mark your calendar and go to Wellversed World Facebook yes. and check check it out. You will be blessed and informed. I mean, you know, I kind of thought I knew a lot of stuff what's going on, but boy, you'll learn. <laughs> you'll learn some more, and you'll be inspired, and you will be empowered to go out <laughs> and take a stand, an active stand, and that fear and no fear and intimidation in <laughs> Jesus' name, because that. That's, those spirits have been over the church for too long, have been over the pastors, have been over the leaders, have been too long. Those spirits of fear and intimidation, we break them off this day in the name of Jesus, and we call forth courage and boldness in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So this is your time to speak now. <laughs> I want to compliment you on the organizational structure of this. That takes a lot of work. A lot of work done this, and it takes a lot of work. But what's amazing is you have kept yours on time, and never in the history of the universe have I heard a Zoom conference that stayed on time. You have done a miracle comparable to crossing of the Red Sea. And <laughs> but it helps to text a couple of people and say, we're running a little behind. Could you cut it shorter? <laughs> it's the clock myself, so we keep you on time right now. <laughs> perspective is from the standpoint of having been a lifelong pastor so churches are my heartbeat and then I, I was called uh 64 years ago when i was nine years of age august the 13th uh to a governmental anointing and so uh, my, my lifelong calling is to bring biblical principles of governance to government leaders and uh, so i'm gonna give you kind of a, a, a landscape overview and then try to analyze what in 2020 has unfolded in our own uh, current venue uh, in terms of church life right now. But there's, there's 364,000 churches in America. Now that sounds like a lot. The problem is 72% of them are by their own definition left-wing liberal. So we, we can count out uh, 264,000 of them. That leaves 100,000. So 28% on 100,000 would be, uh, by their own definition, would be Bible-believing or conservative. Now, of those, how many have a biblical worldview? <clears throat> Unfortunately, the number is really quite small. I'm quoting George Barnum, uh, who's a very close personal friend, but he's also the most quoted living Christian in the world. Uh, it, it could be as low as 6,000, as high as 15,000. There's about 5 million pastors globally, but in terms of just the U.S., 364,000 churches, 100,000 of those considered conservative, but on the, on the high end, 15,000, of a distinct biblical worldview. Now, what is a distinct biblical worldview? <clears throat> well, I can do that by an illustration from another piece of Barna's research, where he said 90% of pastors agree that the Bible speaks to the cultural, social, political issues of our day. However, when asked in the survey, will you or have you spoken to what the Bible says to the contemporary cultural, social, or political issues of the day, have you, 90% of those pastors said no. So you get the counterbalance. 90% says, yes, the Bible speaks to those issues, but 90% says, no, we will not. Now, why is that? Well, some are not adequately in, uh, informed. They, they, they weren't trained. I, I went through a bunch of graduate degrees, but I was never trained in the biblical principles of governance, for example, civil governance, not, never once. I had to learn that all after. So some would fit in that category. Uh, some were afraid. Uh, they'll offend people. Uh, some pastors worship at the altar of nickels, noses, and numbers. And when you do that, you're afraid to speak out on an issue because it could drive people out of your church. Some have an honest heartbeat for evangelism and pastoring and are concerned if they speak uh, prophetically to some issues. 
it makes it impossible for them to minister to the very people they're trying to reach. That's a legitimate concern, but sometimes it's a, a wimp out. It's hard to know the heart of the pastor on that one. But the result is we have an entire, well, the research shows this, 92% of people in the pew do not have a biblical worldview. And that's a longitudinal study over a duration of about 30 years and it's remained a constant. If you go to millennials only, 96% do not have a biblical view. So that means of the millennials sitting in the church, four out of 100 actually have the capacity to apply the scripture to the larger issues of life. Now, if we shift from, from the, behind the pulpit to, to the pew itself, in a survey that Barna also did, he discovered that lay people said we'd speak out on the issues if we knew what to say. But we don't know what to say. Now, that's why Mary Ann is holding that, that book up uh, means a lot to me because that book was written just because of Barna's research conclusion that lay people said we, we don't speak on the issue because we don't know what to say. For the last four years, that book's been out, and I made this same offer to everybody. If you buy just one book, I'm going to make it real hard for you and, and charge you retail. But if you'll buy a case of it, 18 to a case, sometimes 24, but 18 to a case is normative. If you'll buy a case of it, I'll sell you at my profit. I mean, at my cost with no profit. At my cost with no profit. Because I want to get the word out. What's the book cover? The book lays out the biblical foundations to 30 political topics. Taxation, immigration, minimum wage, social security, health care, welfare. You name the topic, it, it covers that. And it's, it's, it's designed for laypersons. It's kind of like a, a quick encyclopedia. You can pick up a unique chapter standalone by itself and discuss what does the Bible say about this particular topic. Because here's the key. Everybody knows the Bible speaks to personal issues of life, to family issues of life, to congregational issues of life, church, church congregation, but they don't realize the Bible speaks with great clarity to the issue of civil governance. I catch this next one. To the extent that we follow biblical principles of governance, to that same extent, we'll reduce human pain, suffering, and poverty. To that same extent that we violate biblical principles of governance, to the same extent, we will increase human pain, suffering, and poverty. It's not an issue of Democrat versus Republican or even right versus left. It's an issue of right principles versus wrong principles. So if you have certain leadership in a city for the last 55 years, like Minneapolis or Portland or Seattle or, or, or Chicago or New York, for the most part, and you have certain principles, then it will heighten, it will increase human pain, suffering, and poverty. That is precisely what we have going on in those cities right now and why the suffering is going to get considerably worse. It, people say Democrat versus Republican. That's true. But it's a body of principles or constructs that either lift up people and bring peace and tranquility to community because that's the way the scriptures, scriptures design or they go anti-scriptural and they bring incredible horrific pain and heartache and suffering to that community. Now, some pastors will say, well, I don't want to touch the, the political issue. One one pastor, he pastored a church, I pastored a large church, but he pastored a church way larger than mine. And he says, Jim, I'm not political like you. It was a put down to me, quite frankly. He's a friend, and I accept that. But it was, he was condescending in his statement. And I said to him, I says, I'll call him Bill, not his real name. I said, Bill, my problem with you is not that you're not political. I'm not asking you to do that. My problem with you is you're not biblical. And what I mean by that is if I were a slave and it was 1860, I was a slave in the South. Would I want my slave owner to go to Jim's church or Bill's church? The answer is Jim's church because Jim will address the, the offense and the sin of slavery. Or if I'm a baby in the womb of a 14-year-old girl who lives near Planned Parenthood, would I want that girl to go to Jim's church or, or, or Bill's church? The answer is Jim's church because Jim will address the issue of abortion and take every step possible to save the life of a baby. So it's not about being political, it's about being biblical. It's about being governmental, because God's the inventor of government, and it's God who establishes uh, nations. Now, why have pastors gone silent? Well, I alluded to a couple of reasons, but let me allude to one more. July the 2nd, 1954 is the demarcating point of all of America. July the 2nd, 1954. To put it in just a, a few sentences, what could take an hour, Lyndon Baines Johnson, then senator, returned from Texas. Many of you already know this. He was furious with two businessmen who'd gone after him and one pastor to some measure. And he got back to uh, Washington, D.C. as a senator coming out of a bruising election. And they were uh, doing an overhaul of the tax code. And, and so he gave an amendment, what later became known as the Johnson Amendment, 
it had a voice vote and there was uh, no discussion of the topic. And he suddenly said that, that nobody of a 501c3 could, af could affirm or oppose a candidate. The problem is that can't be defined by the IRS itself. By that I mean, if a preacher says, we never vote for a, a candidate for abortion, we only vote for those that are pro-life, is that not in fact a de facto affirmation of a candidate and a renouncing of another candidate? The answer is yes, it is. So as many of you know, around uh, quite a few of us recorded sermons defying the IRS in which we advocated for a candidate and denounced other candidates and mailed our sermons to the IRS wanting to provoke a lawsuit because 3,000 attorneys of the Alliance Defending Freedom were prepared to defend us. I, I don't know how many sent them in, probably around 4,000, I think, uh, but we never did. We couldn't get the IRS to bite. They would not sue us because they, they knew the Johnson Amendment, which had never been tested in court, could not possibly stand. But pastors started hiding behind that and say, well, the law doesn't prevent, uh, doesn't allow me to. That's not true. The law of the land is the Constitution, not the Johnson Amendment. And, and so consequently, some pastors who said, well, I don't want to speak on this because I don't want to be, quote, political, they'll even use phrases like this. I only preach, what you, I only preach Jesus. Well, that sounds good. I preach Jesus, and I have for 50 years, and give an invitation to receive Christ almost every sermon that I've ever preached. Uh, but I also pre preach what Jesus preached, and that was the kingdom. What's the kingdom mean? The kingdom means somebody's over everything, a king. I've only been, I've, we've met with nine heads of states, presidents, prime ministers, and kings so far in our ministry. We've only met with one king, King Abdullah II in Jordan. As we walked into his palace for a meal that he had prepared for us, I realized this was my first time being in the presence of a king. And it shocked me because I realized he's not up for re-election, ever. Uh, his daddy was king before him, and presumably his son will be king after him. This is a king. He has complete control. We can't relate to that because we're part, obviously, where there's elections and people get voted in and voted out. This is a king. So when you preach Jesus, you not only preach Jesus, but you preach what Jesus preached. That was the kingdom. Who's the king? kingdom? It's his. And, and who's the king? Jesus. And was he king over? Everything. And everything includes the government, the civil governance. That's why we would address the issue of abortion, not because we're single issue people, that is a foundational issue. If a baby can't make it out of the womb, it certainly can't enjoy anything else the Constitution provides. But we preach it because Jesus is king, his kingdom. And the kingdom breaks in right now in this present tense through each one of us. And we proclaim the kingdom. That's why we would protect the definition of marriage or protect our relationship with Israel or whatever. Because the kingdom declares those particular things. Well, now we roll right now to 2020. I want to check my time to make sure I'm not over here. We rolled to 2020, and, and, and the government has shut down our schools, our churches, our businesses. And suddenly, pastors, many more pastors, are waking up. Something has gone wrong in this. And, and some pastors have even emerged who fought against people like us for 40 years who were activists on these issues, and suddenly they're going, oh, my goodness. Well, what these guys have been saying has been coming for 40 years. It's now here. And so the good news is there are pastors who have risen up who previously were silent or even criticized people like myself. Uh, we have pastors all over, in particular California, Rob McCoy. His church normally runs 350. You know how many had a couple Sundays ago? 2,500. Why? Because people were flocking to Ventura because there was a man of God willing to stand. Now, I don't know what's unfolded in the last few days because we've been on the road and we just flew in a little bit ago from the Midwest. But last I heard, the government officials were meeting and they wanted, a, they wanted to be able to go in and shut down his service. Now, I, I, I'm not, many of you may be up to speed on that. Not, I would not. Jack Hibbs is another one. He has stood. He was, he was actually in a meeting at his church and he announced publicly, there are, I'm aware there are people here in the auditorium now. And he had, he had I think he had, 14,000 people, people were driving in getting hotel rooms because they're willing to stand with a man of God who's going to have meetings against Gavin Newsom's declaration. You can't even sing in a church and you can't meet in a church. And, and so the result is people drove in and came and got hotel rooms because they wanted to be, they wanted to support somebody who was standing. My own son-in-law had a service. And after the service, a guy sent him an email and said, I didn't talk to you, didn't meet you. But my family and I drove two hours to come to church. He said, we're not religious. We don't go to church. 
We don't even care about church, but we care about what's happening in our nation. And we drove two hours to come to your service just to stand with you because your willingness to stand during this time. Uh, this is anecdotal. This is not obviously uh, anything scientific, but my dental hygienist says to me, he says, you won't believe Jim, the number of people I'm cleaning their teeth. And they tell me, I don't know what's happened to my party. I can't vote for my party anymore. I don't understand what's happened. And we have literally, unfortunately, Democrat governors and mayors standing with antinomianism, the lawlessness, and they won't even make a declaration about it. Good news, there was a rally in San Diego a week ago Sunday. I had the privilege of being one of many speakers at it. 43 state capitals had these rallies for religious liberty. A lot of uh, courthouses had it. Uh, city administrative buildings, these rallies were all across America. People rising up. Again, it's not Republican versus Democrat, not ultimately right versus left. It's right versus wrong. When, when the Supreme Court of the United States violated the First Amendment, by the way, Supreme Court rulings are not the law of the land. The Constitution is the law of the land. The Supreme Court ruled on May the 30th, that was Passover, Shavuot. On that weekend, they ruled that a pastor here in San Diego could not meet in his church. And on July the 25th, the Supreme Court, John Roberts whipping out in both of these, absolutely a ruled that they could not meet in Nevada, could not meet in a church. A casino could meet at 50% 50, uh, 50 capacity. A church could only meet with 50 people. And when a group of people from a church went into a casino to hold their service in there, the police and the governor and the attorney general and the mayor of Las Vegas came after them and tried to shut them down. Now what's happening is people are awakening and they're becoming aware that something is happening. Uh, the, it, David Barton has the largest collection. I'm going to close with this thought because I got one minute left. David Barton has the largest collection of, 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 of original documents from the founding fathers before 1812 of any private collection in the world. In there, he has the actual transcripts of the sermons of, of that era before 1812. I said, what do the preachers preach on? Barton said, everything. I said, what do you mean everything? He said, everything. Everything that was in the news, that's what the preacher preached on. They preached specifically bringing biblical principles of whatever was happening. And I'm praying for an avalanche of a revival across churches, across pastors, where we'll once again get back to biblical principles of governance. And the Christians, by the millions, will become educated, articulate, and able to stand firm in the midst of the crisis we're in. Mariel, thank you so much for the privilege of being with you. It's 1.45. I will stop on time. The first time in my life I've ever stopped on time. You are awesome! <laughs> no, you are very honoring. You're always on time. God's perfect timing. You know what I just read? It was like, I don't know, at 3 o'clock this morning, and I hadn't been to bed yet <laughs> um, this morning. And I, I did read that the people who attend church now here in California just came out that they were... In one county, they were going to be arrested and up to one year. Up to one year. Wow. Wow. The church better rise up. And I love what happened at Rob McCoy's church where you, I heard this on your, on your Facebook, where there were, uh, as you said, it's usually 450 people that attend the church and 2,500 showed up. And you shared this, Jim. You said that, that there were people who came from out of the area, out of the counties, to come and stand with them. And, and there were people going up to the front, you know, up to the congregation. Those who were in front of line and saying, hey, let me take your place and stand in line. Let me get the ticket because they would get a misdemeanor ticket and um and that is just the church coming together and saying no no more no more enough is enough let us worship no more we gotta hold the line as sean fox says hashtag hold the line i'm loving what sean's doing we're going to be sharing about that what's happening in our state capital september 6th in a little while but you know and you're doing have you You've written a book with David Barton, too. That's correct. The book is called This Precarious Moment, and we deal with everything from uh, racial healing to solving the immigration challenge to dealing with 
what this what we face with millennials to uh, how, the proper treatment of Israel. To, it, it, it's six precarious things that we need to deal. And, and one of them is reestablishing the Judeo-Christian foundations of America. And then the last one is let the church start acting like the church again. It's called this mm -hmm. precarious moment. And if you go to this precarious moment dot com you can see 12 uh, really well done videos that david and i did together rosemary's on there too david's son tim is on there uh but there's 12 videos on this precarious moment dot com excellent okay thank you so much so much you've written so many books i can hardly keep track i imagine your bookshelves are, are huge bookshelves so we would like to invite Vicki Norden, a friend, a, a ministry. She's got it. She's had her own ministry for, for, for years. She's been a prayer leader throughout California. And she is also running for the Senate in District 17. So, Vicki, would you please pray a blessing over Jim and Rosemary and release the word? Wow. Thank you, Jim, so much for what you shared. And it's so true. It's time for. Uh, we can no longer halt between two opinions as a nation and we are one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all and if the foundations be destroyed what will the righteous do so i thank you father that you have raised up rosemary and jim for such a time as this in the government gateway as they stand for righteousness and truth lord may they continue to be a flame of fire that ignites passion all across this United States of America. Lord, even as in the natural, California is a flame of fire in many ways right now. I thank you, Lord, that they are instruments of yours and you release them to bring light and hope to a nation. Lord, that's been uh, divided in many ways. Lord, we say what you say that united we will stand. Lord, I thank you for the united relationship that they have, an example to many, Lord, not only for the nation of America, but also for Israel. And I bless them, Lord, as they stand in the fullness of your glory for such a time as this in 2020, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Jim and Rosemary. Thank you, Vicki. We are contending for God's kingdom come to rise up in California and that the government shall return back upon his shoulders. Amen? Amen. Okay. Thank you so much. And now...